I'm so thrilled that you've decided to join us for this worship hour. My name is David Shin, and I'm the president of Washita Hills College. And today's study is entitled, Does God Care What I Do With My Body? Before we open the Word of God, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to open the Word of God together. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures that is able to make us wise unto salvation. We pray for the Holy Spirit that inspires would also be the Spirit that instructs. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, we live in a society today where individuals, even within the church, have this assumption that it doesn't matter what I do with my body because, after all, it's my body. And this is pervasive throughout society. And even in Christianity today, the assumption that one is saved almost gives license to the notion that I can eat or drink any way that I want to. Because after all, spirituality is about the soul and it has nothing to do with my body. Is this a biblical assumption? Is it a an assumption of scripture that my body is something that I can put on, put anything on my body, put anything in my body that I want to because that's works and that does not have anything pertaining to salvation. I want to open the Word of God with you today as we go through this study that poses this question, does God care what I do with my body. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, you have the first angel's message. The Bible says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. This is the final message that is to go to all the world before Jesus comes a second time. And the preamble to this is a scene on Mount Zion, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, where you have the 144,000 standing with the Lamb, and they have the Father's name written on their forehead. That's the goal. The goal is to get us in that face-to-face -face encounter with God Himself, and the reason that God is able to have this face-to-face -face encounter with us is because the Father's name is written on our foreheads. Now, it's interesting because the first, second, and third angel's message that comes after this scene of the Lamb standing with the saints on Mount Zion is really a message that is to prepare a people to be translated without seeing death. And it has several different components, as we've just read here in the first angel's message. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Now, there's a phrase here I want to focus on. What does it mean to give glory to God? Now, when you're studying the Bible, it's important for us to compare Scripture with Scripture. So if we compare this with another passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there you have it, friends. The Bible indicates that the way that you give glory to God is by what you do with your body. Whatever you eat, put in your body, Whatever you drink, whatever you do with your body, you do it all to the glory of God. So one of the ways that we can honor God is by what we do with our bodies. And you'll notice that the second segment or the second component of the first angel's message is, number one, to fear God. And the second thing is to give glory to Him. And the way that we give glory to God is by what we eat drink, or whatever we do with our bodies. Now, in summary, we can see that God's end-time message includes health and temperance. Let me say that again. God's end-time message includes health 
and temperance. In other words, there's going to be a proclamation that goes to the entire world before Jesus comes that indicates that it's very important that we take care of our bodies. Whatever we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Many people think that the way that we give glory to God is by our praises, our adoration, our worship of Him, but it's a lot more tangible than that in the sense, even, shall I say, practical, that you can give glory to God by what you choose to put in your body in the form of beverages and also the type of food that you eat as well. Now, before we get to the heart of today's message, I want to focus in on three reasons why health and temperance are divorced from spirituality by many Christians today. So we want to delve into this brief introduction and I want to begin by looking at an individual. His name was Augustine, uh, Bishop of Hippo. He lived from 354 to 430 AD. Augustine was a theologian. He was a brilliant mind that lived in the fourth century, the fifth century, and he had this theological mind that really set the stage for much of Protestantism and Catholicism today. Protestant thinking is due to a large degree uh, Augustinian. You remember that Luther was an Augustinian monk, and so these presuppositional ideas that Augustine laid the foundation for were, was a seminal moment in Christian theology that framed Catholic and Protestant thought alike. Now, Augustine, being a the theologian, and theology has to do with God, man, and the world, he, rather than going to the scriptures to an understanding of human nature, decided that he would go to Greek philosophy to come to an understanding of what human nature was. And it was really very simple. You had the body, which is the external husk, and then inside you had the soul. This body-soul dichotomy was pervasive in Greek philosophical thinking. Plato and Aristotle had this idea of the dichotomy between the body and the soul. And Augustine, rather than going to the Bible, to come to an understanding of human nature, decided that he would go to Greek philosophy because after all, why should I do the work? Why not just go to these quote unquote brilliant minds to come to an understanding of what human nature was? And so here, Augustine made this critical mistake in the very beginning. Rather than coming to a biblical understanding of human nature, he decided that he would go to the Greeks and he imported into Christian theology this philosophical idea of the body-soul dichotomy. Now, it's very simple when you think about it because, well, maybe it's not so simple, but it's so pervasive throughout Christian society today. Everyone assumes that you have a soul. Every no one knows that you have a body. And in reality, Augustine's assumption or importation of the body-soul element into Christian theology brought about this idea that your body was material. Your soul was what was spiritual. In other words, spirituality really had to do with your soul. It had everything to do with this part of the human nature that remained untouched by the body and the body was excessive. Now, it's interesting to note because when you look at this body-soul dichotomy, it has a lot of implications to Christian theology today. Let me give you one of these examples. If you believe in the body-soul dichotomy, which 99% of Christianity, Catholics and Protestants alike do today, it has this interesting way of impacting how you see, for instance, death. Now, I've been to funerals before, where you see an individual that is laying before you in an open casket and the preacher gets up front and says, ladies and gentlemen, brother so-and-so has departed and he's right now looking at us from heaven. And you know, I find it very strange because I said, well, it's an open casket. He seems to be right there, but no, that's his body. And the soul 
has gone to heaven and they're looking down on us right now and they're actually happier uh, in the place of heaven and uh, don't cry because uh, they're really in a better place. And that is an implication, the natural result of believing in this body-soul dichotomy that came in through Greek thinking and Greek philosophy. In other words, the soul is the part that is the timeless entity that ascends to God, and that is your consciousness. The body is superfluous. It really doesn't matter. There's other implications of the body-soul dichotomy as well, because a number of years ago, Pope John Paul II, in a Catholic encyclical, indicated that the Catholic Church had adopted and incorporated evolutionary thought into their theology. In other words, macroevolutionary thought was not incompatible with Christian theology as the Catholics understood it. Rather, it was in harmony. Now you're thinking, like, how could you believe in Christianity and evolution? Well, the reason for that is because the Catholic mind and the Catholic theological frame has everything to do with your soul. It has nothing to do with your body. Evolutionary, macroevolutionary thought is material, but it leaves the soul intact. Therefore, the Catholic theological frame could say, like, look, evolution, that has to do with the body. It's evolving. It doesn't really matter. But Catholic theology says, as long as the soul remains intact, these other things do not matter. So you can see there's a lot of implications of the body-soul dichotomy. I've just given you a couple. Now, one of the implications that, that has relevance for the topic of our study here today, our body, is that when you believe in the body-soul dichotomy, it's easy for us to come to the conclusion that, look, the body, what I put in my body, what I put on my body, what I consume, what I eat, what I drink, all these types of things, are not a part of the spiritual frame. It's not, it has nothing to do with your spiritual experience. And that is why when you engage an individual on the street and you say like, look, you should give glory to God by what you eat, drink, or whatever you do, there's this visceral reaction that many people have. Ah, that's legalism because spirituality really has to do with my soul. It has nothing to do with my body. Now, if Augustine would have gone to Scripture, he would have come to the conclusion that this body-soul dichotomy is unbiblical. So here it is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we can see here that the biblical understanding of a soul is not this dichotomy between the body and the soul, you are a soul. You don't open the hood of a car and say, where's the car? I mean, that's a ridiculous notion. The car is the whole thing. You don't look at your body and say, where's my soul? You are a soul. In other words, the Bible indicates that a soul is the whole being. It includes the body. Now, it's interesting because at death, the reverse happens. The breath of life, goes back to God, and the body returns to dust, and the soul ceases to exist. The notion of the immortality of the soul has deep and far-reaching implications for Christian theology. Not only that, it impacts very practical things to how you view the consumption of certain type of items into your own body. Because if you take this understanding that, that human nature is this unique dichotomy between the body and the soul, and the soul is really spiritual and the body is not, it's material, then yes, the natural conclusion is that anything you do with your body has nothing to do with your spirituality and it's all about the soul. But if you are a soul and the soul is this holistic entity, then spirituality takes on a different frame. It includes what you do with your body. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 says, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. In other words, 
in the end of time, there's going to be a clarion call that goes to all the world before Jesus comes that is going to prepare a people to meet him face to face. And the clarion call is going to be by implication because whatever you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How do you give glory to God? By what you do with your body. In other words, the implication is that in the end of time, there's going to be a false theology out there that says you can do whatever you want with your body because your body is material and, and that you really have this soul that is the most important part of your spirituality. It is equated with spirituality, which means that in the end of time, there's going to be a clarion call that goes to all the world that calls us back to a biblical understanding of human nature, the soul is the whole being. And that is why when it comes to health and temperance, what I do with my body, the Bible says that the entirety of the human nature is the soul. Your body is an important part of spirituality because according to scripture, there is no body soul dichotomy. So reason number one, why Christianity today and much of the world does not believe in health and temperance. What I do with my body is because of the body-soul dichotomy that was incorporated from Greek philosophy into Christian theology by Augustine. So we come to number two. Reason number two, that salvation is reduced to the courtyard of the sanctuary. Now, when you look at the sanctuary, there's three different compartments in the sanctuary. You have the outer court, you have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place. The outer court has two articles of furniture. You have the altar of sacrifice and then the laver. And then you go on to the holy place and it has three articles of furniture, the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread. And then you have the most holy place, which has the Ark of the Covenant. The sanctuary really is a kindergarten illustration and it's very simple. God in the very beginning with Adam and Eve had this face-to-face -face encounter and they were able to have this communion that was unique, that was very special. After sin, the entire human race was placed outside of the gate and the sanctuary really reveals to us the plan of salvation in how God will bring us all the way back to that face-to-face -face encounter with Him. He brings us into the courtyard, He brings us into the holy place, and then He brings us into the most holy place experience. Now, when you look at the sanctuary, you'll notice that there's a goal, there's a telos, there's a place that God wants to bring us in our relationship with Him. And He brings us into the courtyard where we're born again, and then He brings us into the holy place where we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the question is, which is more important, to be born or to grow? Now, a number of years ago, not long actually, at the time of this filming anyway, uh, we were living in Alaska and uh, my wife says, uh, I think we're, we're pregnant. And I said, oh, well, that's not exactly in our plans. Uh, we were planning to foster and other things. I had a lot on my plate. And uh, so I went off to the drugstore to get a pregnancy test. And we got this thing and waiting for an eternity. And suddenly, bing, we were pregnant. And my wife and I, being type A personalities, uh, decided that we'd be ready for this birth. So it was Lama's class. Uh, we had even had an app to indicate uh, the beginning of the contraction and the end of the contraction. And nine months went by and then the birth pangs, pangs began and suddenly here we are. And it was a long labor, 52 hours, exhausting. Finally, the moment came. The baby was born and all of those ceremonial things, you know, you cut the umbilical cord, you put the first diaper on and, and I'm like, oh, praise God, you mark it on the calendar and you, and you put the time. And then the stunning realization came over me. I got to keep this baby alive. In other words, birth was one thing. You know, praise God, every year we have a birthday. But, but after this, you have, to, you have to keep the baby alive and you have to the baby has to grow. And I remember 
the nurse was indicating to me, you know, um, do you know, David, you have to, you have to feed this baby every two hours. And I thought to myself, like, yeah, eight to five or business hours. They said, no, 24 hours around the clock. And then the daunting realization came over me. Birth is one thing. Growth after birth is another thing. Both are essential. When it relates to the Christian experience, it's important for us to recognize that the new birth is the foundation. Without birth, there is no life. We're not minimizing that. So you come into the courtyard, you're born again, you're baptized, but that's only part of the experience. We're not minimizing justification. But after that, you come into the courtyard and you experience the grace of God in growing you as a Christian. And there's a lot of Christians out there that are 30 years in Pampers, or even worse, in the NICU. So God wants us not only to be born, He wants us to grow. Now it's interesting, when you look at the bird's eye view of the sanctuary, after you come into the courtyard and you go into the holy place, there's an article of furniture that you come to. It's on the left-hand side as you come in. It's the candlesticks. Fascinating article of furniture. You come in there and the candlesticks were, were to be lit, but the oil was to be filled every single day by the priest. Now imagine this. Every day, the priest would come inside the holy place and have this jar of oil, and would pour the oil into the lampstands, and as a result, there would be light. In other words, according to Scripture, the priest represents Jesus. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is being poured out into us, the church, and as a result, there is light. Now, at the top of these lamps, there were almond-shaped bowls. The fruit, the light, the result of the Holy Spirit being poured out into the church is light. One of the fruit of the Spirit, according to Scripture, is temperance. Now, think about that. One of the fruit of the Holy Spirit being in the life is self-control. And self-control has to do with your body. Now, it's interesting that this place in the Christian experience of of being in the courtyard and then the holy place and then you come to the lampstand. In other words, in your relationship with God, after He comes into your life, after you accept Him as your Savior, then you go into another experience where you're being filled by the Holy Spirit and then you produce fruit. Self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit and that is directly related to your body. In other words, if you reduce Christianity to just the courtyard, to just the new birth experience, which we all praise God for, and you miss out on the growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you don't experience the fruit of the Spirit, by the way, one of the fruit of the Spirit is love, being a loving and lovable Christian. In addition to that, the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. In other words, you can't fabricate this. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you will be given the fruit of the Spirit, one of which is self-control, which is directly related to your body. 2 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have of God, and you are not your own. The Bible indicates that our body is God's temple. And one of the most uh, greatest insults that you could ever do in the Jewish sanctuary was to bring a pig into the sanctuary. That was the greatest insult because the pig was an unclean animal. Now here the Bible indicates that our body is the temple of God. We are bought at a price. And so we need to be very careful what we put into our bodies. If our bodies are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit resides in our temple, the Bible is indicating by implication that we need to be very careful what we put in our bodies. So reason number one, 
for the, for the reluctance to embrace health and temperance by Christians of today is because of the body-soul dichotomy. Reason number two is because of the reduction of Christianity to the courtyard, to just the birth experience and not the growth experience where we get this, the fruit of the Spirit, which is temperance. And then we come to reason number three, and it's really very simple. I want what I want. In other words, it tastes good. I like it. I want it. It appeals to my appetites and carnal desires. And I think this is the real reason why individuals today embrace this notion that it doesn't matter what I do with my body is because it feels good. It tastes good. I like it. You know, these, these things I've been used to a long time. And who wants to give up things that you enjoy, especially with our unsanctified taste buds? By the way, our, our passions and appetites have become perverted because of sin, and our taste buds need to be retrained. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, For ye are yet carnal. In other words, the Bible indicates that our carnal natures, our appetites, and our passions are pulling at us to certain desires. And this is ultimately the undergirding and the reasons why individuals do not embrace this ideology that it's important what we do with our bodies in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So reason number one, the body-soul dichotomy. Reason number two, the gospel has been reduced to the courtyard of the sanctuary. And reason number three is because of my appetites and passions and my desires, I want what I want. Now the question is, is there a biblical justification for this idea of health and temperance in the end of time. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus gives a book endorsement. The Bible says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, there's a lot that we can say about this idea of the abomination of desolation. We're not going to go into all that, but I just want to make a simple observation about this verse. Jesus gives a book endorsement. Did you know that Jesus gives book endorsements, or at least book recommendations in this case? Jesus, in that great end time chapter, Matthew chapter 24, says that if you're living in the end of time when there's pestilences, rumors of wars, and all these types of earthquakes and pandemics, sound familiar? that if you're going to be living in the end of time, which I believe, friends, we are, that there's one book and one book in particular that we should be reading, and that is the book of Daniel. He says, Daniel should be read and should be studied. So in the end of time, Jesus gives a book endorsement, and there's three observations that we can base on from this book endorsement given by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Point number one, Jesus stated that Daniel was a prophet who had written a trustworthy book. In other words, the book of Daniel has authenticity. It has veracity. It is a book that we can trust. Do you believe in Jesus, friends? If you believe in Jesus, you can believe in the book of Daniel because Jesus said that Daniel was a prophet. He didn't say a false prophet. He didn't say this person didn't know what he was talking about. He says, by Daniel the prophet. In other words, the book of Daniel can be trusted. Do you trust Jesus today? Then you can trust the book of Daniel. In other words, there's people today, higher critical scholars that say that the book of Daniel is in question. They say that they question the veracity and the authenticity of whether Daniel is really relevant for end time living and whether this author is really who he says he was. Some people even question the dating of the book of Daniel, whether it was written during the time of Babylon because of Daniel chapter 2. They say that it's impossible that a person could predict the future with such stunning accuracy. But if you believe in Jesus today, you can believe in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is trustworthy. Now, we need to read the entire Bible, but it's interesting that Jesus pointed out 
that there's one book and one book in particular that we should, spe that we should have special attention to living in the end of time. Point number one, Jesus stated that Daniel was an inspired prophet who had written a trustworthy book. Point number two, the book of Daniel should be read and studied. In other words, this book is not one that we should just ignore. This is not a book that we should just put on the shelf. This is not a book that, as some people say, no one is able to even understand this book. Quite the contrary. Jesus indicates that this book should be read and studied. And furthermore, he says that it's a book that we can understand. Whoever reads, let him understand. Point number three, the book of Daniel's messages are relevant and practical for end time living. There's people out there that say that the book of Daniel lacks relevancy. What is the relevancy of a book that was written thousands of years ago? Here we are in the 21st century, cell phones, the internet, a globalized society, and people are looking at the book of Daniel and saying, what does this ancient book have anything to do with my Christianity, with my experience? Jesus says the book of Daniel should be one that we read and study. Now, it's interesting because the book of Daniel is one that is quite unique even in the title, Daniel. El, where we get the term Elohim, El Shaddai, names for God. Daniel literally means God is my judge. Laodicea means a people judged. Now, many people think that Laodicea means lukewarm, but quite the contrary, that is a characteristic, not a literal interpretation of what Laodicea means. So we are Laodicea. We're the last church living in the end of time. Of the seven churches, Laodicea was the last church. And Daniel represents a type of the last generation that is to live right before Jesus comes, a type of those that are going to be translated without seeing death. So Daniel and the stories of Daniel are really lessons to us, practical lessons, as Jesus indicated, that give us special wisdom to make it through the end of time. Now, the book of Daniel has two genres, prophecies and stories. You have the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2, uh, the image, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the, the legs of iron, and, and the feet partly of iron, partly of clay, of course, the, 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 the brass that's also in the image. And you have the, the, the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9. You have the 2300-day prophecy. You have the 1260 prophecy, the 1335, and the 1290. So these are prophecies, and interwoven among these prophecies are stories. There are eight stories. Six of the stories are characteristics that we are to emulate as the prophecies are being fulfilled. Two of the stories are characteristics that we are to avoid as the prophecies are being fulfilled. Now, the two stories of characteristics that we are to avoid are Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar's pride. The stories that we are to emulate as the prophecies are being fulfilled are the stories of Daniel and his three friends on the plain of Dura that would stand for the right, though the heavens fall, Daniel and the lion's den. Now, the one story that the book of Daniel begins with, incidentally, is the story of, that is found in Daniel chapter 1. Very interesting. And Daniel chapter 1 begins with the theme of health and temperance. Now, who's Daniel a type of? He's a type of the last generation. He's a type of God's people living in the very final moments of earth's history. And it begins with health and temperance. Now, a little bit of historical background on Daniel for us to recognize here. Daniel was a eunuch. Uh, he went through this surgical procedure. You don't hear about a Mrs. Daniel in the Bible. And they wanted to ensure that these men were always keeping their minds on the king's business. And so Daniel was made a, a eunuch 
in the court of the king. And the reason that this happened was because Jeremiah had given a prophecy that the children of Israel, because of their unfaithfulness, were to be in captivity for 70 years. It was known as this time of exile where the people of Judah were taken away into captivity into Babylon and Daniel was one of those individuals. It was to be 70 years where God's people were to be under the bondage of the king of Babylon. And Daniel and his three friends were taken to the University of Babylon, full scholarship, and they were taken there in the court of the king. You know the story. In Daniel chapter 1, he goes to the cafeteria. And there in the cafeteria, he sees all of the delicacies that are before him. And Daniel and his three friends say, look, that is not going in my body. Wow, what a stand that Daniel took. Now recognize that if Daniel and his three friends would have piled their plates high and said, when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do, there would be no book of Daniel. The rest of the book of Daniel flows out of this fateful decision where Daniel, maybe 16, 17, 18 years of age, has the audacity as a captive, uh, a Judean captive in a foreign land, in a university, under a pagan king, has, has the presence of mind to say, look, that is not going in my body. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Look at that. The key word in this verse is defile. Do you see that? The word defile. Now the word defile implies the only way you can defile something is if it's sacred. If it's holy, remember what the Bible says in Corinthians, that your body is the temple of God. So Daniel already had this frame that, look, partaking of certain foods and beverages into your body is really, really defiling the body temple. And this was such a critical stand for Daniel in Daniel chapter 1 that he said, look, I'm not going to do this. And I believe that he was willing to die. If you ever question that, just read about Daniel in the lion's den. Read about the three friends on the plain of Dura. These men were serious about their spirituality. In other words, a prophetic book begins with this notion of health and temperance. And in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel goes to the king. Or actually, he doesn't even go to the king. He goes to Melzar and says, look, I'm not going to eat that. And just so you know that it's in your best interest, we're going to go on a 10-day test. We're going to eat what we want in terms of this type of food, pulse, vegetables, natural foods, and the rest of these individuals are going to eat the king's diet. And you see for yourselves, 10 days later, Daniel and his three friends are standing before Melzar. Their, Their skin looks like It's been, you know, doctored up maybe with oil valet. They're like, it doesn't rub off. They're like, of course not. This is natural. Their hair looks like it's been in some shampoo commercial. It's just shiny. No foul breath. The elastic step. Erect bearing. Their skin is not cracked. The rest of the individuals that are standing around them that have been eating of the king's diet, foul breath. Their hair has lost its shine. Their skin is cracking. They look emaciated. And Melzar says, well, the proof's in the pudding. You can eat your unique diet. And look at the story. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says, And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. In other words, If you want to understand the prophecies of Daniel, 
You've got to practice the temperance of Daniel. Let me say that again. If you want to understand the prophecies of Daniel, you've got to practice the temperance of Daniel. There's a direct cause to effect relationship. Now, this is about cooperation. This is about bilateral cooperation. Unilateral is one way. Bilateral means cooperation. In other words, God doesn't just come down and force food in our mouths, say, eat this, drink that. It's not about force feeding. God gives us choice. God gives us free will. God gives us volition. So God initiates by saying, look, your body's the temple of God. I want you to eat certain things, just like an owner's manual of a car. You have certain oil. You have certain types of transmission fluid. God is the, he's written the owner's manual. It's the Bible. He's the creator. And he says, look, there's certain things I want you to put in your body and not put in your body, and it's in your best interest. God initiates. He's not going to force us. And so when we respond, which is bilateral, initiation, response, Initiation, response. So in this bilateral walk with God, God initiates by giving information to Daniel. Your body's the temple of God. Don't eat certain things. Daniel responds by treating his body as if it is sacred because it is. It's holy. And so he chooses a diet that's in accordance with biblical principles. And as a result, the Bible says that God gave him knowledge and understanding. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams of all kinds. In other words, there is a natural part, natural laws of, of physiology as it relates to our bodies and minds that the Bible is talking about here. But in addition to that, as we go through this process of following God's biblical principles that has natural results, God adds to the increase. And here it is in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, the entire verse. To these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. There you have it, friends. Daniel went to Princeton and Yale and Harvard and came out on top because he had the audacity to say, I'm not eating that because guess what? This is the temple of God. You can experience what Daniel had experienced back many centuries ago by following these natural laws. In other words, Christianity, spirituality includes what we do with your body. And if you want to understand the prophecies of Daniel, you've got to practice the temperance of Daniel. Now, here's the question. What was Daniel's diet? Daniel chapter 1, verse 12. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. The question is, what is pulse? The term pulse has roots from the word seed and is a reference back to the Genesis 127 vegetarian diet before sin. The book of Daniel begins with Daniel and his three friends choosing to eat the original diet of Eden. We are not saved through vegetarianism nor veganism. However, the book of Daniel does reveal a connection between diet and spiritual understanding. So here it is. In Daniel chapter 1, which becomes the foundation, the pivot point for the rest of the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends make this critical stand to honor God, to glorify God by whatever they eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And as a result of that, they have an enhanced spiritual understanding. Desire of Ages, page 101. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. This self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight, which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's word. For this reason, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for Christ's second coming. Did you hear that? Did you get that part here? The self-discipline that is essential for men mental strength is self-control in order for us to practice and understand the spiritual truths for our time, 
We need to practice health and temperance. And you know the experience. Thanksgiving, you've eaten a little bit too much. You should have stopped. And then out comes the dessert. And you don't eat one piece of pumpkin pie. You have four with whipped cream on top. And after you eat that amount of pie, which you shouldn't have eaten in the first place, you don't feel like having a Bible study. You're like, where's the couch? And then you wake up the next morning to open your Bible. Your mind's in a fog. You're just like having a difficult time. That is because there is no body soul dichotomy. What you've just consumed has, has affected your spiritual perception. And it's for this reason that, that we are to cooperate with God and be careful what we put in our bodies. Now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we have the motivation for what drives us as Christians in terms of giving glory to God through our bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let me unpack this for you, friends. He begins by saying, I beseech you, therefore. Therefore is a concluding word. In other words, you have premise, 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 therefore. Now, up to this point, Paul has been building a beautiful theology, an exposition of the gospel, how you're not saved by works, how you're justified by faith and sanctified by faith. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, up to this point, and now this is in Romans chapter 12, up to this point in Romans chapter 1, all the way up to Romans chapter 12, he's been building this beautiful theology that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he summarizes this in the phrase, by the mercies of God. In other words, the premise of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is the gospel. What God has done for you. Has God been merciful to you, friends? Has he given you chance after chance? Has he given you opportunity after opportunity? Has he been patient with you? Has he been long-suffering with you? He has with me. I mean, I would have given up on me a long time ago. But we have the grace of God, the mercies of God, the, the God who never gives up. Has God touched your life? Has He given you the greatest gift in His Son? All of heaven was poured out in Jesus Christ. And so he begins Romans chapter 12 by saying, I beseech you, therefore, on the basis of the mercies of God, in light of what everything that God has done for you and me and the gratitude and the warmth and, and how it touches the very depths of our soul, what is the response to that? Let's read the next phrase. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. What does it say? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Did you catch that? This is the book of Romans. This is Paul, friends, a New Testament book, a New Testament writer that believes in righteousness by faith, believes that we're not saved by works, who believes that we're justified by faith, sanctified by faith, that it's a free gift from Jesus Christ. This man who believes in the gospel, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, based on the mercies of God, based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is a gift to each one of you, says this, to give your body, your physical body to God as a living sacrifice. In other words, you can see here by implication that Paul doesn't believe in this body-soul dichotomy. 
He doesn't believe that the body is superfluous, excessive, not a part of the Christian frame. It's important to the Christian experience. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in light of everything that God has done for you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You don't give to God a dying sacrifice, a weak, emaciated, anemic sacrifice. He says, in light of what God has done for you, I'm giving you this. Now, one day we're going to get a better version of this. But until then, I want to glorify God with my body. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And then the last part of this verse, look at this which is your reasonable service. Friends, it's not unreasonable. It's not irrational. It's not something that is excessive. In other words, in light of everything that Jesus has done for you and me, Paul is saying it's perfectly reasonable to say, Lord, I'm giving you this. I'm going to give you my body. Now, let's say I've had a long day at work. I come home and my wife says to me, honey, and I have a four-year-old and one-year-old. She says, honey, I've had a long day with the kids. I'm exhausted. Oh, there's, a, there's a bunch of dishes that are just piled. It's a mountain of dishes that's piled in the kitchen. Uh, honey, could you, could you just help me out and do the dishes this evening? I just, I just need to lay down. And I look at my wife and say, Honey, is this a divorce issue? My wife's going to be like, Have you lost your mind? I mean, what are you talking about, a divorce issue? Of course it's not. And I say, Honey, if it's not a divorce issue, then I don't want to do it. Oh, can you imagine? I don't want to do it. The next day, I come home. There's clothes strewn all over the floor. Kids have been playing. My wife's like, oh, honey, it's been a long day. Would you mind picking up these clothes on the floor? And I say, honey, is this a divorce issue? And she says, of course it's not. And then I say, well, if it's not a divorce issue, I don't want to do it. Everything that my wife asks, oh, divorce? Well, then I don't want to do it. How long is that marriage going to last? Friends, we treat God worse than that. When we say, Lord, is this a salvational issue? Huh? Is this a salvational issue? And if it's not a salvational issue, well then, I don't want to do it. How many of you would want to be in a relationship with someone like that? Bare minimum. What is the least I can do? I'll tell you what, God has feelings too. How many of you would want to be in a relationship with someone like that? That's always looking for the minimum. Well, guess what? 1 Corinthians, no, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 says, And receive from him anything that we ask, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Did you get that, get that last part? We understand that we keep his commands. That's the requirements. But the last part of that, and do what pleases him. In other words, in a relationship with anybody on this planet, in terms of a marriage, we know that it goes beyond the bare minimum. We know that it goes beyond just, just those things that are divorce issue, deal breakers. But we want to do above and beyond that. Because who wants to be in a relationship with someone that's just looking for the minimum? God wants to be in a relationship with someone that is so touched by the mercies of God that we say, Lord, whatever it is that you want me to do, I will do. I want to please you, God, because of all that you've done for me. Friends, I tell you today, God loves you. He loves you more than you will ever know. We're told that all of heaven was poured out in the gift of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? 
and he would have done it just for you. Now, you may be at home wondering, like, I mean, me, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I don't value myself. Well, no, 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 don't, don't believe that. That's a lie. When, when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, the bank of heaven was empty. It was empty. And he would have done it just for you. Your, the relationship between God and you is so intimate and so deep and so profound. It's as though you're the only person in the world. You, you have value. All of heaven was poured out in the gift of Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that. Believe it because it's reality. God spends his day thinking about you. He invested everything put all the chips on the table to save you, friend. And in light of that, when you accept him as your savior and Lord of your life and you're touched by his love, have you ever been touched by someone? They gave you something that you simply did not deserve. Well, God on a whole other level did that for you and me. And I want to make an appeal to you to first of all, accept Jesus as your savior to recognize that the only way that we're going to be fulfilled in this life is by accepting him into our lives. There's a God-shaped hole in our hearts that he can only fill. And when he comes in and you're touched by his love, you're touched by his mercy, you're touched by the gift of Jesus Christ, and you're touched by the mercies of God, then you, like Paul, can say in the book of Romans, therefore, brethren, according to the mercies of God, you say, Lord, because I've been touched by your love, not because I have to, but because I want to, not because I'm working my way to heaven by healthful living, but because I want to give you the best version of this. I want to glorify you with my body. Would that be your prayer with me today to say, Lord Jesus, whatever I eat, whatever I drink, whatever I do, I do it all for you. Now, this is something that we can't fabricate. It's a gift. You can't foster up willpower for self-control, but you can say, Lord, help me to be willing to be made willing by his grace. And the Lord will work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. May God bless and keep us to that end. Amen.